begin to suspend disbelief, begin to look at the things that you want to create and take all that disbelief and reorganize it, reprogram it, change your perception around it. Because when we're in that story of disbelief, that's what we're creating. So take a minute to really look at all the disbelief and find a way to reframe it, but reframe it in a way that you believe it. So if you've got disbelief that you could never lose that weight, start to reframe it with a belief system that's truthful to you, that's natural to you, something along the lines of, I believe that I can get to the gym every day and that's my first step. I believe that I have the power to eat more healthfully. So leaning into a belief system that is real for you, that you can actually hold on to, that you can actually believe in. Because if you start to use affirmations and reframes that you don't believe in, they won't work. That's just the bottom line, they won't work. So reach for thoughts that you believe in. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something more inside you too. You've got Michael Jordan level genius at something. So today let's live your best belief life and learn how to attract things into your life. Enjoy. Sit in a daily experience of visualization. Visualize yourself going to that gym. Visualize yourself in that healthy body. Visualize yourself eating that healthy meal and chewing it slowly. Or visualize yourself on that date with that partner that you long for. Or visualize yourself working with the people that you love to work with that support you so much. And then the next and final most important step is to allow that visualization to become a feeling. Let that visualization take over you emotionally so you can genuinely feel a connection to what you're seeing. So I allow my mind to wander and I see myself and what it is that I desire. And then I let the feeling take over, the feeling of being taken care of, the feeling of being supported, the feeling of working and co-creating with people that I love. And, and that's what I'm currently visualizing. And so being in that feeling is what truly manifests this into form. What's most awesome also is that you start to feel what you want to create even before it comes into form. So it's as if it's already happened. And that's actually the key point here, which is that you being in the energy of what it is that you want to create actually makes it so that it is there even if you can't see it. And you got to believe it before you see it, as my teacher, Dr. Wayne Dyer, always said. Rule number two, rewire your brain. With John Asaraf. When you have something in your brain that, that uh, a neural network says, well, uh, what if this book comes out and you fail? What if it's not good enough? What is scientifically not correct? What if, what if, what if? My brain's gonna process that the same way as your brain and everybody else's brain because that's, everybody's brain's the same. The mechanism of how the brain works, it's Einstein's brain, Hitler's brain, Genghis Khan's brain, Tom Bilyeu's brain, John Astor's brain, all the same functionality. So if you understand the mechanics of what's supposed to happen, then you say, okay, great. When I feel this, then what am I going to do? So I, I like to use a, uh, an analogy of a car. You're driving a car and you're talking to a friend of yours and a light pops up on the dash. You don't take a hammer and hit a light. <laughs> it's a signal. Something's happening in the, in the, in the, in the engine, in the trunk, in the, in the tire. Something's happening. Emotions and feelings aren't uh, positive or negative. They're empowering or disempowering to varying degrees if you don't understand them. And so if you think about fear, right? How does a firefighter go into a burning building when there's this enormous adrenaline and, and epinephrine, you know, that could stop most people dead in their tracks? They learn, here's the feeling, it's normal, do you have the knowledge and the skills and the preparation to deal with this in a safe way? Go. If you don't, now you retreat. So we have this phenomenal brain, right? It's, it's, it's genius abilities. We can't figure out how to re replicate it anywhere with billions of dollars, uh, but we are getting some of the user's manual now. So when you feel fear, what should you do? I teach the first two inner sizes that I teach every one of our students. Number one is called take six, calm the circuits. So if you have this unpleasant, anxious, fearful emotion, energy in motion, right? And it's unpleasant and the brakes have gone on. If you just take six deep breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth like you're breathing through a straw, you will deactivate the stress response center 
which means blood is going to go back to the left prefrontal cortex, the Einstein part of the brain can actually think through this problem, because what happens when the stress response center is activated, blood goes away from that into the fear response, so you have epinephrine, cortisol, adrenaline, to be able to get you out of this situation. It's part of our in instinctual brain, part of the reptilian brain. The first part of the brain that was developed was that, then the mammalian brain, the limbic system, then the neocortex, the thinking brain. So when our brain has this signal of, oh my God, you might get hurt, you might lose this, you might get in trouble, you might be embarrassed, ashamed, ridiculed, judged, etc., that part of the brain is going to get activated. So if you take six deep breaths first, calm down, calm the circuits first, then do inner size number two is called AIA, A-I-A. The first day is for awareness. What am I thinking right now? What am I feeling right now? What am I sensing right now? What is my behavior right now? So you, thoughts, feelings, sensations, awareness of behavior. What's my intention right now? That's the I. Well, my intention is to move forward. I want to do this. Great. What's one very small action step that you can take? Now, the reason you want to take one small action step is one small action step your brain can handle. If it's one small step towards it, the threat response goes away. But if you focus on the end game right away, you're going to get that rush and that instant trigger of the fear response, stress response. So the first thing you want to do is learn how to manage your mindset and what you focus on. Learn how to manage your emotions because they drive your behavior more than anything else. Because we move away from pain and we move towards pleasure, but we move away from pain a thousand times faster. <laughs> and pain wires in the brain faster for survival mechanisms. So purely from a neuroscience perspective, just understanding self, once you understand, oh, okay, this feeling is normal, okay, what should I do? Take six calm the circuits, Aya, and now you can start being progressive and make progress towards what you want. Now, while you're in the, you know, in the, uh, what am I thinking feeling, it's a chance to be aware. And the biggest gift we have as human beings is our awareness. Because awareness is what gives you choice. And choice is what gives you freedom. Most people are living their lives in a reactive state, automatic reactive state because of these set points that we talk, started talking about. So we're in this repetitive cycle over and over and over and over. We react to the same things, we behave the same way, we eat the same foods, we dress the same way, just to maintain that homeostasis and comfort zones. And we've never been taught. Like when, when were we taught it as kids? Like here are your six core emotions. Here's the way you deactivate you know, your stress center or fear center. Here's how you activate your imagination center. Here's how you have more focus. Here's how you develop a new belief. Here's how you develop a new habit. Here's how you release one. We haven't been taught that. We've been told they're important things, but we haven't been given the tools, and then we haven't practiced the tools enough to be able to make them part of our unconscious competence brain. Rule number three, use the power of objectivity. With Mel Robbins. Hey, it's Mel, and I am so excited to share this very simple, surprising, and shockingly powerful trick that you can use if you ever find yourself feeling stuck when you're manifesting. Feeling like you can't visualize the steps that lead you to what you want is an extraordinarily common obstacle when you're manifesting. Because remember, manifesting is the practice of preparing your mind, body, and spirit to do the work to achieve the things that you want. And as you probably know, manifesting has four different parts to it. First of all, you gotta give yourself permission to really have what you want, okay? Because you gotta have the thing that you're visualizing be something that is authentically something that you want. Number two, you must see yourself taking the steps, the tiny actions and doing the work that will lead you to creating or having what you want. Third, you got to feel in your body what it feels like to do the work. And you also have to feel pride as you see yourself doing the work because that amplifies your mind, body and spirit really imprinting and training and preparing for it. And fourth, uh, obviously, you got to take the actions. And all of that manifesting and preparing inspires you to take the actions. But one place 
where so many folks get stuck when they start trying to make manifesting a daily habit is you go and you know what you want, but then you sit down and you try to imagine what the steps are that you need to take to get there, and you don't have a clue. Your mind goes blank. If this is you, I'm so excited that you're watching this because the simple trick based in science is called the power of objectivity. All you gotta do is stop visualizing yourself and insert your friend Mel Robbins or insert somebody else that you love and admire. And the power of objectivity is going to immediately switch you from a blocked mind to one that is bolder and more creative and able to visualize the steps. Now, I'm not just making this up. There's extraordinary research that was just written about in the Harvard Business School Review. They did eight different studies at the University of Wisconsin where they were studying the power of objectivity. And with thousands of participants, here's what they found. When participants tried to visualize themselves doing hard things, immediately the participants, when they thought about themselves doing something hard, like let's just say asking for a raise, okay? I want you to imagine yourself asking for a raise or applying for that dream job. When you visualize yourself doing it, you immediately focus in on minutia. You start imagining all kinds of things that could go wrong. You start arguing against yourself and doubt comes flooding in. You have a very cautious mindset when you place yourself in those scenarios. However, if you were to visualize me, Mel Robbins, asking for that raise, immediately your mindset switches to being very bold being creative, seeing all kinds of opportunities. And in fact, when you not only visualize me, your friend Mel Robbins asking for that raise that you want, when you give me advice, you're super enthusiastic. You're like, Mel, you should go for it. And I bet in your life, you have probably told friends or loved ones, you should ask for more money. And you mean it because you're visualizing them. But you yourself won't visualize yourself doing that. You talk yourself out of it. We've all had this experience. You yourself are probably sitting there going, you're right, Mel. I constantly tell my friends, you deserve more. You should break up with that jerk. Do, 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 do. You should go for it. But when it comes to yourself, you see the excuses in depth. So I want you to leverage not only this common sense, but this research to your advantage when it comes to manifesting. Pick what you want. And then if your mind goes blank when it comes to seeing yourself do the work, Literally just insert your friend Mel Robbins or insert anybody that you love. In fact, I got a story about this. Years and years ago, this would have been, God, 20 years ago. At the time, I was a life coach and I had a really small little practice here in Boston. And I went to a seminar that Oprah Winfrey had here at the Boston Convention Center. It was part of her like Live Your Best Life Tour. And I went to the seminar because I thought, well, this would be a great place to land life coaching clients, right? You got thousands of women at the convention center who all want to improve your life. So I can go and I can network and who knows, I might meet some amazing women and meet some amazing business partners and land some clients. So I'm sitting in the audience and, you know, the DJ starts playing the music and everybody gets out of their chairs and we all start dancing around with our name tags on. And then all of a sudden the DJ dies down the music and we all settle down and this woman walks on the stage. Now, I didn't recognize this woman. I didn't have my program in my hands. So I had no idea who it was. I had never seen her before. I had never heard her before. When they announced her name, not a clue. All I knew was when she started talking, something inside me was like, Zzz! energetically, something shifted. I bet you've had those moments where you're like, boom, you know that something is meant for you. You just feel pulled toward. Like you can have this experience with a piece of clothing, with a house, with a puppy, with a person, with an experience, with a place. Well, this woman walks on stage and I had this energetic shift that was like, <sighs> and I immediately felt my body go, you need to be doing that. But what I saw was she's on a stage. She's clearly an author. She's making people laugh. She's inspiring. Oh my gosh, she's a life coach? Well, this person I'm talking about is none other than Martha Beck. I didn't know her at the time, but she's an international best-selling author. She writes for O Magazine. She was clearly speaking on a stage. 
And guess what? She was Oprah's designated life coach. And so I have this energetic shift where I'm like, I want to be doing that. I, I, I want to go from just coaching individual clients to having an impact on a much bigger scale. Now, keep in mind at the time, I have only been coaching people for two or three years. I've never given a speech. I had never written an article in a magazine. I didn't have a book. I didn't know how to do any of those things. But I went home from that uh, seminar and I sat down and I cracked open my journal and I'm like, I want to speak on stages. I want to write things for magazines. I want to write a book. I want to impact millions of people. I want to do what Martha Beck is doing. I didn't know how to do any of it. And so I developed this simple tool. Now, little did I know, I was just instinctively leveraging the power of objectivity. Since I didn't know what to do, and I also didn't know who to ask because 20 years ago, I didn't know a single person that had published a book. I didn't know anybody that wrote for magazines. I didn't know anybody that spoke on stages for a living. And I certainly didn't know anybody that knew Oprah. So I didn't even have anybody that I could ask. There weren't as many articles online, so it's not like I could blog. YouTube was not really a thing, so it's not like I could watch videos. I mean, you know how lucky you are to be able to research all this stuff? I was just me, Mel Robbins, with a handful of clients here in Boston, now inspired to do what Martha's Beck doing, with no clue how to go from here to there. I didn't know the steps. So I came up with this little tool. It's so funny when I think about it now. Do you want to know what the tool was? What would Martha Beck do? <laughs> I said, well, what would Martha Beck do? Because I figured Mel Robbins had never done any of those things, but Martha Beck had. So in any moment where I didn't know what I should do, I just figured I would ask myself, well, what would Martha Beck do? And I kind of thought that maybe if I acted like she acted, maybe I would eventually start to steer my life in the direction that her life was headed in, in terms of writing books and standing on stages 20 years ago. So I was leveraging the power of objectivity. So this is what happened. A couple weeks go by and nothing miraculous happens in my life. And I get an email. And I'm up late and I'm working on something and this email comes in. And the email is from a friend of mine who works in New York. Hadn't seen her in a while, but she knew that I was a life coach. And I noticed that she was forwarding a PR request from Inc. Magazine. And Kate wrote to me, hey Mel, not sure if you're still life coaching, but see below. Someone is writing an article about life coaching for Inc. Magazine thought you may be interested in applying. So I scroll down and I immediately start to read the email. Now there were a couple things that jumped out immediately, right? Number one, the PR request was over a month old. Number two, the deadline had already passed for submissions to be featured in the article. Number three, I had none of the credentials that they were looking for for life coaches. Number four, I had none of the types of clients that they were looking for. Now, Thinking about it from Mel Robbins' point of view, my mind got very cautious and I started to focus on all the minutia. I'm too late. I'm not qualified. I've missed the deadline. They're never going to pick me. Self-doubt started to creep in. Just like it's happening for you when you manifest right now. Your mind is going blank. You're full of doubt, which is why you can't see the steps. I, in that moment, asked myself, well, I know what Mel Robbins would do. Mel Robbins would hit delete and go on with her evening. But what would Martha Beck do? The second I leveraged the power of objectivity and I imagined her in the situation that I was in, my mind got more creative, it got bolder, it got more energized, I saw possibility. I literally said to myself, well, what have I got to lose? Martha Beck would probably just respond. And so I did, I just freeformed the thing. I wrote this long email, blah, 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 and then hit send. Do you know the very next morning, the person that had sent the inquiry out wrote me back and said, I've already finished the article. I was about to submit it, but I was so taken with your email that I'd love to come up to Boston and follow you around for a day and include you in the article. And it was that article, which published about five months later, that caught the attention of a bunch of people in the media business in New York. And that's what caused this major pivot that happened in my career. Honest to God, it was the power of objectivity and simply asking myself, what would Martha Beck do? So 
super common to feel super stuck when you know what you want, but you can't visualize yourself taking those steps because you're thinking cautious. Your self doubt is consuming you. You are insecure in your ability to actually do those things. So you can't even embrace the visualization of yourself doing it. Simple, insert someone else. And you can always pick your friend Mel Robbins. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number four, Big Extraordinary. With Brendan Burchard. I get asked so many questions about like, how do you do all these things and how do you, how do you achieve a long-term dream? Not just get stuff done and be more productive on a Monday and Tuesday, but like move yourself to bigger and bigger goals and dreams in your life. And I'd love to share that with you. I got, I got four big ideas for you. The, the first one is obviously, you gotta see yourself in scenes in your life that don't currently exist. And what I mean by that is, you gotta visualize specific scenes that you would love to manifest in your life in the future. Um, many of you guys know, I'm from Montana, right? I'm from this tiny Irish mining town uh, that was economically depressed for a century by the time I got there. And my parents, you know, raising us four kids, I literally don't know how they made it. I don't know how they supported us, and we really, really struggled. But somehow, I, I always could, I visualize things for myself. And I, th I remember thinking one time when I got to college, I was like, you know, I would love one day to live on a beach. And I would love to like get up in the morning, go walk on the beach, swim a little bit in the ocean, have a nice breakfast, sit down with my journal, and then go about the day. I, I could see myself talking with people and new cultures and traveling. I could see myself being somebody who was a person of influence in some way or another. And I had no idea how all that was gonna manifest, but I did not fear to dream, or when the visions came in, I didn't like stop them and say, well, that's stupid, because I'm just a kid from a poor town. I did not know that one day I could live on my dream beach. That was not the point. It was that I, I saw the scenes and I allowed to dream about them. You have a lot of visions and you have a lot of dreams that you have where you just go, well, that's stupid, or I don't like that, or what would they think, or who am I to do that? And I'm here to tell you, explore those visions. Maybe you were given those visions and those visions were a gift to you that you're supposed to manifest. And so what I'd love for you to do is think out 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and just try to imagine scenes in your life. Because what most people do is they don't see scenes in their life, they just write down to-do lists and goals. And so every day it's about a to-do list and they're trying to just be more effective and productive each week, but they're not seeing the bigger picture. So even though they're getting their to-do list done, they got a lot of goals, they're not excited. They're not enthusiastic. They, they, they don't have that vision pulling them forward. And so see the scenes that you might have in the future with your family. You know, see the scenes that you would have in your personal lifestyle, like how do you live, what do you do, where do you go? See the scenes of yourself performing or doing your work or your career. See the scenes of yourself happy and fit and healthy and explore those. And I mean, every day. Like visualization isn't something you do once in a while on a birthday or when it's New Year's. It's like every day. So you guys know I wake up every morning and I stretch for about 15 or 20 minutes if I don't do my morning workout. Then I read some motivation or inspiration for 20 minutes. Then I sit down with my high performance planner. I write down my day and then I push away from having written down that. And now I just start seeing the scenes of the day. How can I do them with joy and excellence? I start visualizing a bigger picture and seeing just what comes in about my future. I'm consistently engaged in future thinking, future envisioning. And it's not like everything has come true, but I'll show you, you know, the, the, the scene that we're in right here, from Montana to this scene, I envisioned 20 years ago. Think about that, 
20 years ago, I was like, I'm gonna live on a beach one day. When I lived in Montana in the mountains, uh, as far away as possible, I, I'm telling you, more is possible than you actually know right now. The second big idea I wanna share with you, in order to achieve that, after you envision it, in order to actually get there, sometimes you're gonna have to prioritize skill building over stability. And what I mean by that is maybe you, you, you have this idea that you're going to have this dream career one day. Well, maybe you're going to have to be an intern first and be barely able to afford rent to build up the skills that would deserve and grow you into that career, right? We, we have to think about, okay, in order to have this vision that I have, what specific skills would I need to develop this year, next year, over the next five years, over the next 10 years to get there? You know, I, I was a kid that was kind of awkward. Well, I, I still am awkward, but I was like, I was the kid who, I just, I was kind of happy-go-lucky, but I just, I was kind of scared of people because where I grew up, there was a lot of abuse and a lot of people smacked people around where I grew up. So I had to get over that. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna be a great communicator one day. So I started taking classes on communication, reading books on communication, you know, reading the classics like how to win friends and influence people or how to be a positive thinker or how to be a person of influence and lead others. And I just started studying communication. When I wanted to do this work, I had no idea how to do video. I didn't know how to do podcasting. I'd never learned HTML yet. I didn't know about a blog. I didn't know how to do an event at a venue, let alone you know, the thousands of people now that come to our events. I had to put that on my skill building sheet and say, okay, there's gonna be times that I'm gonna prioritize skill building over having a stable job or having you know, a stable income or having like a stable, like I know exactly how every week is gonna go because I was gonna be a collector of skills. I was gonna have that vision and go like collect all the skills to get there, even if in the short term sometimes it was hard. You make sense? So make a list of all the skills you need to develop and then you have to ask yourself, are you willing to compromise your lifestyle a little bit to develop those skills? Sometimes that means working for less pay. Sometimes that means going and getting a mentor and, and working with a company and, and just starting from the ground up to develop skill. But your skill set is the pathway to the greater visions of life. The third thing I think you have to do, which most people don't talk about, is you have to build your network. You gotta build your network. I, like, I'm here because I've told a bajillion people, like, one day, I'd love to live on a beach. And I tell people in my network, and you know, maybe they had a job that was related or not related. Maybe they knew people who lived on a beach, maybe they didn't. But everybody around me always knew the things I wanted to achieve. I wanna write a book. I wanna be a speaker. I wanna do podcasting. I wanna shoot on YouTube. I wanna you know, be a person who gets to share about life transforming ideas and tools that inspired me. That's what I want to do with my life. I want to help people achieve their dreams faster and improve their lives. And I would tell everybody that. Even though I started talking about that when I was broke, I was struggling, I was trying to get my morning routines and my habits together and my health together. I was trying to get my mind together. It wasn't like I had everything figured out, but I let people know along the journey what I wanted. And I thought about the people, who would I have to be friends with? What type of people would I have to know in my industry in order to help me achieve the abundance to make my dreams come true? So what are the exact types of people you need to know? And I mean, what I want you to think is like, who would you love to have on speed dial on your phone? Like the people of your influence, the people in your industry. Oh, you wanna do, you wanna be a filmmaker? Great, who are the great directors you would love to get to meet and have on speed dial on your phone? Right? You want to have a job in this career or that industry? Who are the industry leaders and titans who you would love to have on speed dial? And make it like a game to get to meet those people, add value to those people, befriend those people, serve those people, or work for those people so that now you're in that world. Because if you don't know the networks you need to achieve your dreams, your dreams are really going to be far away. So build the network you need now. And I would say, you know, the last big idea that comes to me is that you must make bold moves sooner than later. I mean, here's the truth. When I was living here in Montana, I envisioned myself living in the Caribbean someday on a beautiful beach. 20 years ago, I envisioned that. If I could go back, 
why did I wait 20 years to move here? Because I thought all these conditions had to happen before I could have the thing. And I'm here to tell you, sometimes the real trick is to put yourself in play in the dream sooner than later, right? You wanna be a, a world famous tennis player? Well, don't think that you need to go do 50 things. What you need to do is get yourself on the tennis court every day. You wanna live on a beach? Move to a beach. Yeah, maybe you're living in a tent or a shack at first, but you're on the beach and you're putting yourself in the motion of the dream, right? You wanna be a filmmaker, film every day, right? You wanna be, I mean, you think about like the greats, you think about like a, you know, like a Steven Spielberg. I mean, he was shooting every day as a kid. It, it wasn't like he was waiting one day to have a producer come along and say, let's make a movie, kid. He just started. And that's what you have to do. Whatever your dream is, please don't be like me and wait 20 years to access it. What I should have done is just moved earlier. But I thought, well, no, this condition, and then I'll make this, and then I'll build that, and the team will be here. And, and it was like, now that I'm here, I walk around and go, look at this beautiful place. Why didn't I come here earlier? So I hope that serves you. You've got more capabilities and potential in you than most people will ever tell you. And most people will tell you, oh, your dream's stupid. I'm here to tell you, visualize it. I'm here to tell you, skill up for it. Get that network and get yourself in play sooner than later because you can achieve extraordinary things. But as my wife always says, you can choose to be ordinary today or you can choose to be extraordinary. So I say, visualize my friends and go make it happen. Rule number five, frame your dream. With Marie Forleo. If you've ever lost motivation because you're afraid your dreams are just too unrealistic, this one is for you. Today's question comes from Bree, who writes, Hey, Marie, you're such an inspiration. I so respect your advice. Thank you. Here's my situation. My whole life, I've had big dreams and lots of ambition. Then this little word started to pop up from people around me unrealistic. For example, I wanted to work in publishing. I was told that was unrealistic. There were so many obstacles and so few jobs. However, I now work for the second largest publishing company in the world. But there's a new dream I want to pursue, and I can already hear the cacophony of voices in my head insisting this dream is unrealistic. A certain level of realism is necessary, but too much can create self-doubt. So Marie, how do I handle not only hearing from others how unrealistic my dream is, but also not let myself drown out my own desires? Thank you so much, Brie. I love this question so much, Brie. Every single one of us who both dreams and creates things faces voices of dissent, both from people that we know, from people that we don't know, and very often the most deadly comes from within. And if we don't take a thoughtful, conscious approach to taking on our unrealistic dreams, they just ain't gonna happen. But if you are up for the challenge, and I think you are, here are five steps that can help. Step number one is frame your dream. And here's what this means. We can't become what we can't envision. So when I say frame your dream, what I mean is I want you to take a picture of it in your mind's eye in vivid, specific detail. And then what I want you to do is translate that picture into words, meaning write down that big unrealistic dream. And I know that you may have heard about the power of writing things down before, but the truth is most people just don't do it, which is so crazy because the research is conclusive on this. There was a study done by Dr. Gail Matthews that shows that you are 42% more likely to achieve your goals if you write them down. So what I want you to do is whip out your journal or hop on that keyboard and get writing. Step number two is filter opinions and fend off negativity. You've got to take responsibility for the energy that you allow in your life. I want you to fend off negativity as much as humanly possible. You know, we know so much more about the brain than we did just 20 years ago. Neuroscience has taught us incredible things like that our brains are continuously shaped by our thoughts and our experiences. And you know this to be true. I mean, negativity is one of the most toxic 
forces on the planet. It's toxic for your brain, for your nervous system, and for your ability to stay motivated. So do me this favor, okay? Do not solicit or listen to the opinions of people who are notorious for just being Debbie Downers. The one mistake that I've seen people make consistently is they almost habitually talk to the exact person who is the most likely to shoot them down and make them feel like crap. So don't do that. And here's another key. I want you to always, always, always consider the source. Meaning, don't put a lot of stock into other people's opinions unless they're actually out there consistently taking risks and being brave and actually making things happen. I mean, if you think about it, let's say, I don't know, you wanted to climb Mount Everest. Would you ever take advice from someone who's never even attempted the summit? No, of course not. That would be crazy. So don't take advice from anyone unless you really think it through. And I want you to ask, has this person achieved an unrealistic or impossible dream? Are they taking meaningful risks on a consistent basis? Do you admire who they are, how they live, and what they contribute? If not, do not use them as a sounding board for your idea. Step number three is flood yourself with positive examples. So once you've removed the negative outputs as best as you can, step number three is all about feeding your mind and surrounding yourself with positive stories on a consistent basis of other people who have achieved unrealistic dreams. So think about Helen Keller, for example, who was blind and deaf by the age of two, yet with the help of teachers, she created this extraordinary literary career, writing hundreds of speeches and essays and books. And there are thousands of biographies at the library or even on Netflix. And the great thing that I love about biographies is you also get a chance to witness other people's stumbles and their falls and all the failures that they experience along the way, which of course, stumbles and falls and failures, those are inevitable for all of us. And you know, it's worth noting that just about anyone whose achievements are worthy of a biography or a documentary probably had an unrealistic dream. So do this for me. Feed your mind examples of people who speak out and stand up for what they believe in and make change happen. Step number four is fast forward. So if you've watched the show for any amount of time, you know this, I love end of life studies. And here's what we know for a fact. When you're on your deathbed, you couldn't care less about what anybody who says your dreams are unrealistic says. I mean, Bronnie Ware's research tells us this very, very clearly, that the single biggest regret people have when they're about to pass is this. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. So Brie, my friend, stop worrying about what other people might think or say about how unrealistic your dream is. It really does not matter. The only thing that matters is what you do about it now. Step number five is focus on action. So this, my friend, is the most important step of all. Action is the antidote to fear. And you don't have to take perfect action. You just need to take any action. Brick by brick, inch by inch, step by step. That is how all great things are achieved. And you know my mantra, I believe everything is figure outable. And the best way to figure anything out is through action-based learning. So one more thing before we wrap up, Brie. Unrealistic dreams are totally where it's at. That's where all the growth and the excitement in life comes from. After all, what other kind of dreams are there? Rule number six, control your thoughts. With Dean Graziosi. What's standing between you and where you want to go is always the story between it. Your next level, there's only a story between you. There's no physical guard, there's no guns, there's no blockade. It's what's going on in here. And when you can understand that your thoughts can make you have a great day or a bad day, when you understand that your thoughts are things, and they're not true. In most cases, your thoughts lie to you. I literally had this conversation with my dad about a month ago. I said, have your thoughts ever lied to you? He's like, I don't think so. I said, no. I said, ever in your life think um, someone you were dating didn't like you anymore, or they were actually talking to someone else, and it wasn't true. He's like, oh, yeah, I remember this story. Did you ever think a friend cheated you or ignored you or didn't call you to go to the movies, and you got upset and got worked up, and then it wasn't true? 
Yeah, and I named like 10 things. He's like, yeah, your thoughts lie to you. I said, of course they do, over and over again. But you could step back and check that thought and just make it a habit. I am not perfect at this, but I obsess on it every day. When I'm in a good mood, I wanna observe what I'm thinking so I can have more of that. When I'm worried, stressed, or a little anxious, I wanna know what those thoughts are. What makes me anxious? When I feel like I have everything I ever wanted, why am I anxious today? And I'll look and go, holy crap, that thought's been hanging around since I was 14. That one's gotta go. So I wanna give you a little story. It's the greatest gift that you could give your family, yourself, and your company. For the next week, obsess on everything that you do after the fact and observe what your thinking was to actually make it happen. And I wanna simplify it. Again, I, I always wanna tell you, I'd love to give you all these things and say, you can go do them all and life's perfect. I understand you're busy, you got life, you got a million different influences. So I wanna give you the things that you could just plop in and not make a big deal out of it. Just observe your thinking. Good mood, just step back. Say, why am I in a good mood? Bad mood, step back and just look at the thought. I wanna give you an example of, because I've been obsessed on this mostly the last 18 months, kind of obsessed for five years, obsessively 18 months, last six months, ridiculously obsessed. So I'm at breakfast with my kids and my son has this crazy memory. So he's got these crayons, a box of like 40 crayons, and they're not like red, blue, and pink, they're like, Lime, lime green tequila gold. Like they're all these exotic names, right? And he's loving these crayons and he pulls one out and he goes, dad, look at this color. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Is that green? He goes, no, it's lime exotic tequila gold. I don't know, I'm making that shit up. Um, but so he remembers it and I'm like, wow, you remembered that one. And he pulls out another one. I'm like, what's that one? And I grab the box from him and I go through this. This little guy remembered all 40 names. I couldn't remember all 40 if I studied for six months. So I'm like, dude, that's amazing. That's your gift, that's your unique ability. My daughter sitting there sees all the praise he's getting and says, I can do that. I'm like, mm, that's not your unique ability. God gives us all unique abilities. Dad couldn't do it, but you're my inventor. You're the visionary, my son's the implementer. If they ever would like each other enough to be partners, they'll be badass. <laughs> so, so my daughter goes in the other room, she studies. She goes, no, I got this, pull the first one out. What do you think? She gets it wrong. And like, Brie, we all, have, and she starts crying. That's not like her. She's like upset. And I'm like, baby, no, no, no. I said, you have a gift. Brody doesn't come up with the ideas you have. I'm like, so I tell her about her gifts and she blurts out and she says, it's because you spend more time with Brody in the morning. And I'm like, oh. So me thinking I'm doing this right, I said to her, Brianna, don't tell yourself a lie and don't tell me a lie. I spend equal time with you two. And I go in that phase, right? And all of a sudden she tucks it down. She goes from crying, tucks it down. She gets dressed or she gets ready. And it's the first day she left since she was born without giving me a kiss going off to school. And I'm like, it's all right. She's learning a lesson until she left. <laughs> and like an hour later, I'm walking around and I do what I'm sharing with you. I observe my thinking. And I'm like, oh, sh <laughs> like literally just like that. I'm not kidding you. And I'm like, I just told my daughter her feelings don't matter. That's what I told her. She tried to express whether right, wrong, or other ways, that's how she felt in that moment. And what I told her was, your feelings don't matter, tuck it down, go to school. If she gets married to a guy and does it to her, I'll kick his ass. <laughs> and if he's bigger than me, I'm Italian, I'll have someone kick his ass. <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm feeling this and I'm like, oh my God, I literally got in my car, I blew a couple red lights, I drove 90 miles an hour, I got to her school, because the best way to fix stuff is just fix it, right? Not think about it, because I observe this thought. Again, I'm just giving you this lesson of what it does for you, because you can observe these things like, like a third party. So I get to the school, and there's two people waiting in the line at the principal's office, so you're supposed to get the little tag and put the name thing on and sign in. I'm like the hell with it. I jumped the fence, <laughs> and I ran across the, the, the field where they all play, right? The playground. And I'm like, imagine if a teacher sees me, there's gonna be 911 air raid. Like there's, there's a security guard at the school is gonna tackle me, I could care less. I literally jumped a six foot fence. I knock on her door, she comes out, I'm like, baby, dad made a bad parenting decision. Your feelings matter to me. I got on my knees, I'm like, baby, your feelings matter. Whether you believe that or not, thank you. I said, whether you believe it, whether I believed you or not, whether it was true or not, it doesn't matter. That's the way you felt in the moment and I should have acknowledged your feelings. Dad was wrong. And we talked, we hugged, we kissed. I literally left sobbing like a, like, like, I was like, bye baby. <laughs> like literally sobbing. And then I was in a great mood. I had the radio cranking, I felt amazing. But it never would have happened if I wasn't the observer of my thoughts. 
and I'm not great at it, I'm not perfect at it, but make it a part of your life and watch how your life changes. Wherever it is you wanna go when you have that vision, remember what's standing in your way is nothing more than a thought. And I tell people all the time, I'll sell the, I'll say to my daughter, she's like, but I don't think it should give me the story. I'm like, can you go grab me that story in the other room? Can you go grab me that thought? No, you can't grab it, it's only in here, Bree. Or Brody, it's only in here, so let's just change that thought and all of a sudden there's nothing in your way. Because it's not physical. It's in here. And rule number seven, the last one we for some very special bonus clips is... Visualize the end goal. With Greg Luganis. When you're teaching about visualization with mm -hmm. these, at these dive yeah. camps or any other athletes you're training one-on-one, -on -one, how do you translate what you learned and experienced visually with imagery? Because I believe mm -hmm. in visualization. I did it for yeah. many years. How do you translate teaching that emotion, that feeling to get into flow? What do you tell people? Well, the first thing with visualization, and I, I learned through trial, trial yeah. and error, because <clears throat> I learned visualization when I was three. Wow. You know, uh, and that was, I'm sure by accident. <laughs> <laughs> My dance instructor said, okay, visualize yourself. You know, no, <laughs> no, she didn't say visualize. She said, okay, um, imagine yourself doing the routine. And she played the music, left the room. I was only three years old, so I was like, okay, you know, that's how I interpreted it. And so that's how I learned visualization. And then later on, I, I learned relaxation exercises when I was going through puberty. It was mm -hmm. like, you know, um, I was suffering from anxiety and stress-related stuff. Uh, I also had asthma. Um, and so uh, what I learned in teaching visualization uh, to dog agility people, uh, ballroom dancers, uh, water polo players, uh, divers. Uh, I had to start with relaxation. I had to teach them the relaxation exercises. Breathe, take, relax, yeah, yeah. Take them through the relaxation exercises. Then they would be have a better opportunity for success in their visual mm -hmm. visualization work. The one thing when I start somebody with visualization work is that I start with something totally away from whatever activity that they're wanting to visualize. Mm. So, like what? <clears throat> well, I have several. I have several kind of fun exercises. Um, I think, let's see, there's a roller coaster ride, there's a horse riding a horse, uh, and um, I think the one that I those, those two, um, because okay, it's it's a wild, it's exciting wild it's, yeah. roller coaster ride, and I try and get them to use all of their senses. What are they feeling? What are they smelling? What are they hearing? hearing? Yeah. What are they, you know, what do they taste? Um, you know, because when that adrenaline starts amping up, then you know you get dry mouth, mm, yeah, mouth. yeah, and um, so those. The horse ride and the, and the roller coaster really taps into the adrenaline. Mm -hmm. um, the one that I really enjoy, especially with kids, is I tell them, okay, you're going to bake some cookies. Oh, and it's like, okay, smell. pick somebody that you, you, know, you want to bake cookies with. Mm. You know, whether it's your mom, your best friend, your aunt, your uncle, whomever. Pick whoever it is. So that there's an emotional connection to that person and then I go through the measuring of the, um, of the sugar and the flour and the texture of the butter and the smell of the um, extract, you know, whether it be vanilla mm. or almond or whatever it is. Uh, so they go through all of their senses, the sense of smell, taste and all of that stuff. Um, and I try and encourage them to use all of their senses mm. because you never know what's going to come out to the forefront yeah. as far as their strength. Um, uh, and so, you know, it, that's, that's how I teach visualization, that it's totally removed from what the activity is. Because that's important, because if it goes wrong in the activity that they're, you know, it's wanting gonna go to wrong do, in it's real life. Gonna, yeah, then it, then it <clears throat> has a tendency of going wrong in real, Interesting. real life. So you have them practice something, other activity first. Mm -hmm. You have them relax, breathe, mm -hmm. go through another activity of visualization. Then do you take them to the dive or to the sport after Not that? Not necessarily. <clears throat> no, I mean, I, I, I let them hang out there. Mm. And then it, it's, it's almost like, 
you know, you, they're muscles, you know, that you're flexing and, yeah. uh, and so you're u- using to utilize. So the more that you flex those muscles and the more fun that you can have in doing it, the more likely you are to practice and, and do it. Yeah. So then you play along, play along, play along. It's like, oh, maybe, you know, let's try this. You know, they, they come to the conclusion on their own usually that, okay, I'm ready for this. And then wow. their visualization kind of steps right into place. That's powerful. Yeah. I've yeah. never heard someone talk about visualizing another activity first yeah. to heighten your oh, senses yeah. Yeah. and then step Definitely. into yours when you're ready. Yeah. So I like that. Yeah. That's a great one. Yeah. I'm gonna start yeah. doing that. Consistent action is the cure-all. Whatever problem you have, whatever issue you're facing, whatever big life you wanna create for yourself, The way to get there is not some giant short burst of effort. It's the daily consistent grinding action that will help you accomplish your goals. People look at my channel and a lot of new people have joined over the past number of years. Hey, welcome aboard. Great to have you. Welcome to Believe Nation. It's a positive, happy place. It's great to have you here. It's an honor to be a part of your daily routine. If you go and look at my my channel, my main channel in the history, it took so many years, guys, so many years of just making content and not seeing any results. It took, I forget what the number is, it took five years to get to 9,000 something subscribers and another five years to get to almost 2 million subscribers. Now we're sitting over 3 million subscribers, etc. I haven't missed an upload every single day for, I don't know, eight years, something crazy like that, every day. I've made videos through travel. I've made videos through electricity electricity outages. I made videos through breaking my neck. I made videos through my tour. I made videos through vacation. I made videos, 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 I made videos. And you can plan, you can prepare, you can get ahead, you can you can batch them. But I don't think your goals count until they're hard. It's when it gets hard, when it, when you get tested, that's when you have to show yourself what you're made of. Even little things like, I remember filming at my dance studio in Toronto and I had my camera guy and my assistant and we're filming and the electricity goes out and then there's a fire alarm. They go, I guess we can't film. Like the first thing that that my camera guy says is, okay, well, I guess we can't film. I can't film with this like electricity outage and then fire alarm, fire alarm, bam, bam, bam. Like you can't film with that. It's like, I'm, I'm filming today. So I took my phone, it was freezing outside. I took my phone, went outside and just started filming. Because videos have to go up. They have to go up. I've I've made videos with my broken neck. I broke my neck in two spots, had a concussion. And next week I'm making videos. They weren't as long, they weren't as good. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm wearing a neck brace. If you look at the old videos, I'm wearing this giant neck brace. I got this giant scab here on my forehead because I smashed my head against the wall when I fainted and that's how it led to the concussion, broken neck. I'm still making videos. Not making videos is not an option. And so if you look at someone like me who is introverted, is shy, who doesn't like the camera, who always thought that people who are famous had a big ego, who I still don't like being on stage. I still get nervous every single time, but I still have a message and I still want to serve. How does somebody like that have this kind of channel? Well, because of every single day making videos. We've done over 10,000 videos. I've done over 10,000 videos. That's crazy. Not all of them are public, but even just on the main channel, let alone this channel and the top 10 channel, the other channel, 10,000 plus videos over 12 years. Why? How? It's just a consistent action. I think most people lose because we overestimate what we can do in a really 
short period of time and underestimate what we can do in a long period of time. You think by putting in three weeks of hard work, you're gonna crush it. But really, if you just stayed on it, like you've, guys, you've had ideas. You have, an, you've, you have had an idea that you loved, that you gave up on too soon, that if you just kept doing it, this is an idea that you had maybe three years ago, that if you just found the way to keep doing it, even part-time, even on the side, even on the weekends, if you just kept at it, you'd be in a different place right now. Something would have happened, something would have paid off. But we're too frustrated to get something to happen right now and I get it, I'm there too. I'm, I'm impatient, I want immediate results, I want things to happen, I'm putting my best. I want this video right now to be the best one I've ever done. And I put my effort to try to make that happen. And I fully recognize at the same time that it's a long game that you have to keep going. And that if it's your purpose, you can't give up on it. Most people just quit too soon. You just quit too soon. And that's you quitting on your dream. And if it's your dream and you want it to happen, it's a daily consistent action to make it happen. So how do you do it? Let me give you some tactics so that you can not just get motivated from a message, but actually apply it to your life. Number one, you have to create a calendar. These videos happen because they're in my calendar. I'm filming this on a Tuesday. Tuesday is my YouTube day. I always film on Tuesday. I block it off in my calendar. Uh, I just came back from vacation. And on the Tuesday of my week, I was still making videos. People say, well, you still work on vacation. First off, it's not work. Like, I like this. This is fun for me. This isn't, this isn't, oh, I have to go make videos. If that was my mindset, I would, I'd, I'd be out. I wouldn't do it anymore. But also, if you're on vacation and you're making videos or you're doing a little bit of work, to spend three hours of a 24 hour day doing something is totally achievable. Somebody, uh, one of the people that I invested into yesterday is like, how do I take a vacation on my business? Like, how do I, my wife wants to know, how do I go on vacation and run this business? Like, you can still, you, you can either plan ahead and get ahead with all your clients, or you can still do some work. Do you not have personal time? Are you gonna be around your wife 24 hours a day? Does your wife not wanna to go to the spa or spend some time on the beach? It's not about the three hours that you spend working. It's about the other hours, the 21 hours you get to sleep, but whatever, all the other hours that you have in the day, it's about intentional time. Most, of, most people's life is not intentional. Most of your vacation time is not intentional either. If you were to spend 21 hours a day with your wife, intentionally creating an amazing relationship, then the three hours a day you're gonna spend working is easy, is nothing. So of course you can take time off. But you have to put in your calendar. You have to create a calendar that makes sense for you. Schedule in when you're actually gonna make your dreams happen. Because otherwise it's just a dream. I could say I wanna make YouTube videos, but if it was never in my calendar, guess what, it would never happen. And this applies for life too. Every, uh, every afternoon at 2.30, I spend time with Nina, with my wife. We spend time in the morning, I take an intentional break at 2.30, we go to the park, we take, we take the dogs with us, we, we, we stay inside and just be together if it's raining, like we'll spend time every day, every weekday at 2.30 because I, want, I wanted to spend more time with Nina during the week. Weekends, we're basically all in on, on the relationship, but the weekdays can be crazy, you know? So we spend time in the morning, we spend time in the evening, and I wanted to spend 2.30, it's 25 minutes together, but intentional 25 minutes. That intentional 25 minutes is worth more than three hours of just sitting in front of a TV. That's not time together. You have a lot more time than you think. You're just not being intentional, that's the problem. If you feel like you got to the end of the week and you were so busy, but you got nothing done and everything's falling apart, you're just not intentional with your time. So you schedule it in. Whatever you want in a life, whatever your dream life looks like, whatever your goals, ambitions, motivations are, put it in your calendar. Two, be the person who follows through on their calendar. Stop letting yourself off the hook for not following through on your calendar. I'm a little tired today because we just came back from our trip. I'm a little jet lagged. Uh, from coming out from the West. 
I'm still making videos. I'm still, videos have to be made. They're going up. Like, when do you let yourself break? If it's in the calendar, it has to happen. Videos have to happen today. I don't care if I'm lying in bed. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care if I'm in the hospital. I've made videos from the hospital. I don't care where I'm, videos have to come up. I don't care if they're the best videos. They're the best with what I can make right now. If I'm tired, they might be lower than my standard, but it's the best of what I can make right now. If I'm in the hospital, it's definitely lower than what I can make out of the hospital, but I'm gonna make the best of what I can make right now. Be the person who follows through on the things that you say you're gonna do. Because the next time you put something in your calendar, the next time we see you're gonna get that goal or do this project, you're gonna, the next day wake up and say, I'm not, I can't do that, I'm not doing that. You're starting to build the identity, either way, of the person who follows through or the person who doesn't follow through. And every time you say yes to yourself, every time you do it when it's difficult, you start to build up that identity a little bit more of I follow through, I follow through, I follow through. So then the next time you put something in your calendar, the next time you come up with a goal, you start to believe that it's actually possible for you to do it because you're building that identity of you being the person who actually follows through. And every time you let yourself off the hook, every time you give yourself a break, every time you say, it's okay, I'm not gonna do it today. Every time you say that, you eat away at that other identity and start to build a new one. The new identity of the person who doesn't follow through. You start to believe yourself a little bit less. The next goal you write down is a little less credible. You don't think you can do it. You're gonna realize the next day that you're not gonna follow through. And so it's, it's a very slippery slope to fall down. So step one is you build a calendar. Step two is you become the person who sticks to your calendar, who follows through on the, on the things that you say you're gonna do. That's why it's important to create a realistic calendar. Don't tell me, don't tell yourself, you're gonna make 100 videos a day every day. You're gonna make 1,000 phone calls a day every day. You're not. You're gonna write 100 love letters to your wife every day. You're not, you're not, it's not gonna happen. Make it a realistic plan for something you can actually stick to. Because again, if, if you just stick to it, Guys, you will hit your goals. If you stop quitting on yourself, if you stop letting yourself off the hook, that idea you had three years ago should have already come to creation because you just stuck with it. Just stick with it. Step number three, so create a calendar, one. Stick to your calendar, number two. Three, the environment around you really matters. Videos like this really matters. Why I create the Inspresso to be with you every morning, to give you the boost, to bring you people like John Asraf and Oprah and Elon Musk and these people who lift you up, who inspire you. Hopefully, that's the intention every time. Join a group like Movement Makers. Be a part of a community. Be around other entrepreneurs who are doing things, who are chasing their dreams, who are trying to make their thing happen. When, you're, when you create that environment and you start to shift it, it inspires you to want to play bigger. It inspires you to want to stay consistent. When you are feeling at your lowest low, when you're about to quit on the thing that you said that you want to do, that's in your calendar, you see it, you see it today, I'm supposed to do that, you like, oh, I don't want to do that. What brings you out of it? It's the habits, it's the environment, it's the routine. Watch another video. Join a group like Movement Makers. Get a mentor or coach. Have an accountability buddy. You have to be around the people who constantly fill your cup, who give you light, who lift you up, who make you believe and help you feel like it's possible. When you do those three things, your life will change. Create a calendar that maps your actions to your ambitions. Be the person who follows through on their calendar. And then be around the people, videos, resources, environment that encourages you, that lifts you up, it makes you feel like it's possible. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome.
If you want to activate the power of manifestation, check the video right there next to us. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and we'll see you there. If the person's doing the vision board and they're saying, when I get my new car, I get my new house, I get my new relationship, then I'm going to feel so great. Well, then they're back to the program waiting yeah. for it to happen.